Um, if you heard me speak before, I like to give background so we understand what we're listening to and, and we're not just kind of wandering around with our own interpretations of, of who this book was for and what was happening. So the book of Jonah takes place about 780 B.C. Uh, that's the, the, the time frame we're looking at. It's about 1,400 years after God established his covenant with Abraham. So we're about 14 centuries after that. It's only about 200 years after David became king of Israel that this is happening. And since that time, the kingdom has been divided. One of David's descendants was not a nice guy, and the kingdom became divided. The southern kingdom, Judah, was only two tribes, Benjamin and David. The rest of the tribes were in the northern kingdom who were in deep idolatry. They set up a, a false temple with two bulls where they were worshiping in Samaria. Um, just not a, not a good deal. Um, so that's what's happening. It's a divided kingdom. The northern kingdom is being harassed by the nation of Assyria. They're mortal enemies, really bad guys, not, not good at all. Um, and then Nineveh is their capital. And Nineveh in Scripture we primarily see in, jo- in the book of Jonah and the book of Nahum. And Jonah, you know, it's, it's not a spoiler, but, you know, he preaches to them and they repent. Right. Um, later on, you know, a, a generation arises that doesn't remember that, and they come and they attack Israel, and they take them away into captivity, the northern kingdom. And later, uh, Nahum, you know, 150 years later, um, Nahum is preaching to them, hey, if you don't repent, you're going to go away, which happens. Babylon takes them over. Um, so that's the kind of the time context we're looking at. If you want to kind of compare it to America, if that gives you a better sense of time. So imagine Jonah is like the Civil War, right, in that time period. That's, you know, how long Jonah's preaching. And then around the turn of the 20th century, around World War I, you know, is when Israel would have been conquered that much further on. It would have been conquered by Assyria. So that's how much time passed. The generation that repented passed away. The next generation arose, and they weren't all about repenting. And so they took over Israel. And then you would come to today's date. That's about the time that Assyria would have gotten wiped out. So from the Civil War to about now is about the difference between when Jonah preached to them and then Assyria was gone because Babylon uh, wiped them out, took them over, and then also took the southern kingdom into exile. And that's where we see, you know, the book of Daniel and things like that and the book of Ezekiel happening in Babylon. <clears throat> so Jonah is a, is a minor prophet. Doesn't mean he's not important, just means the book's shorter. It's only four chapters. Really quick read if you haven't read it yet. Uh, it's different from other prophetic books in that it's mostly narrative, mostly a story versus the prophecies being given. If you read Ezekiel and Daniel, they have some narrative, but full of prophecies. Isaiah, full of prophecies. Jonah's just really about his story and what he does and what happens to him. Uh, if you're my age, when you hear Jonah, you think like flannel graphs. You know, the little thing they would stick on the felt board, and, and some of the younger people were like, flannel what? So somebody Gabrielle's age would be thinking about the singing, talking vegetable, you know, when you talk about Jonah. But he was neither one of those. He was a real guy, right? He was a real person, right? And sometimes we forget that in the Bible. We think it's a story, it's a character. It was a real person, and this really happened. Uh you know, when it was written down, it's hard to say. It could have been written down very soon after this actually happened. It could have existed as an as a oral story for a lot of, a, a lot of uh, years before it had actually written down. Who the author is? Well, as somebody who believes that Jonah actually happened, the author is clearly who? Jonah, right? It, because there's so much that happens in this book that's only between God and Jonah, and oddly enough, I titled the sermon God and Jonah, that only Jonah would have known, and only he could have written this book. Now, we first see Jonah in, not in the book of Jonah, but in the book of 2 Kings 14. Uh, let me read that to you, give you some idea of, of what's happening with Jonah and, and where God is going to take him as we talk about the book of Jonah this morning. It says, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, and this is starting in verse 23. Uh, Sorry about that, 1423. Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria for 41 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn aside from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from gath Hefer. So a few things here. Jeroboam II, there was one much earlier in the history. It was named Jeroboam. This is the second. He's able to take back some territory that Assyria had previously taken. Assyria is in a bit of a lull here. They're having some internal conflicts. They're having to focus on things at home. They pulled back some of their army. So they've taken back the territory. 
And also it's important to mention that just because Jonah gave the prophecy to Jeroboam II that he then acts upon doesn't mean he's supporting this evil king in all of his, his ways, right? God gave him the prophecy. He told it to the king. The king acted upon it. Now, what's interesting to note here, at least to me, maybe to you, is that in John 752, the, the Pharisees say to Nicodemus when he's trying to defend Jesus, are you also from Galilee? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. That's a small problem because Gath Hefer is in Galilee where Jonah arises, right? So either they're ignorant of that or they're discounting him because he was a prophet to not Israel, right? So not sure what's going on there, but Jonah's a prophet. He is from Galilee. So with that as our context and background, let's see what the book of Jonah has to say to us. And we're going to start with the first two verses in Jonah chapter 1. And this is the call, the call of Jonah. He says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, because their wickedness has come up before me. Now, as I said before, Assyria and Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, are mortal enemies of the nation of Israel. The Assyrians, if you look into secular history and some descriptions of how they, they carried out their warfare, they were heinous, what we would call today war crimes. While the battle was ongoing, after the battle was over, the things that they would do to the living and the dead were just reprehensible. They were merciless, horrendous, just beyond description. And as we said, they recently had won back some area they previously lost. And Jonah is enjoying some success in how you would define it as a prophet. You gave a prophecy. The prophecy came to pass. The king has listened to you and acted upon what you have done. So whatever that success looked like for him, Jonah was experiencing it. But God calls him in the middle of all that to go preach to this horrible, brutal, horrendous nation in this wicked city. And that's the call. And it, it doesn't make sense, really. It doesn't really compute. You know, this is, this is the mortal enemy. And in the natural, we look at Jonah, right? He has the king's ear, right? We hear a lot in Christian circles today about speaking truth to power, right? Tell them what the Bible says and influencing political leaders. And Jonah is right there. Like he's, if there's ever a time to influence this evil king more towards righteousness and more towards Jehovah, they just came off a big success. And so in the natural, doesn't it make sense for him to influence this king to move away from his Baal worship and, and move more towards God? And that would actually be fine except for one tiny little problem. That's not what God wants. You see, it's fine to stay where God has placed me until the very second God tells me it's time to move. It doesn't matter if it makes sense in the natural or not. Ironically enough, throughout the Bible, we can find places where God has told people to do things and to walk through things that in the natural don't make sense. You have never been with a man, but you're going to have a baby. Congratulations. And unlike 99.9% .9 of the women who've ever lived, Mary says, okay, right? But logically, that doesn't really make sense. But in this call, I believe what we, see, what we see here is the unspoken but underlying theme of the book of Jonah, and honestly, much of the Bible, but specifically Jonah. And if you get nothing out of what I say today, I want you to, to get this and to, to think about it this week. The theme here is God's ways are not our ways. And we can say, yeah, I agree with that. But when we have to start walking it out, it's painful. It's painful for all of us. Now, we try to make our ways his ways. We make a plan to get him to bless it, even though we haven't consulted him. But it doesn't, doesn't work that way. He's God, we're not. So our direction has to come from him. And that's what Jonah gets. He gets a call. Here's your direction. Go to Nineveh. Preach to them. So Jonah has to respond to that. And what's his response? How does he respond to this call that God has placed upon him on his life? In a word, he responds poorly. 
Let's look at it. I'm going to go back and, and pick it up right up at the beginning and then carry down further. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, because their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found there a ship going to Tarshish. He paid its fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I mean, can he say Tarshish anymore? Like, do we get the point that he's not going to Nineveh? I'm going to go to Tarshish. I'm going to get on a ship to Tarshish, and I'm going to end up in Tarshish. God says, go to Nineveh, and Jonah says, nope, going to Tarshish. Now, Bible scholars argue a little bit about where Tarshish is. They're not certain. It could be Spain. It could be the northern coast of Africa. It could be, could be India. Um, or it could be Sardinia, an island in the Mediterranean Sea. And that, I mean, that's interesting to look into, but in the context of how, what it means for us, it's not that important. What is important is that God says, Jonah, go here. And Jonah says, nope, go in there. And so what that would be like, you know, the, the, the city of Nineveh is um, about 725 miles from um, Samaria, assuming Jonah was in Samaria, which is the capital city. It's about 725 miles from there. And that's roughly the same if he were to say, um, hey, Scott, um, you're in Fredericksburg. I want you to go to Bangor, Maine and walk. That's like the distance, right? Walk there. Maybe if you can find a caravan going that way, you can get a, a little bit of help. But get up, Scott, and go to Bangor, Maine. And Scott says, no thanks, so in Bangor, Maine, I'm going to go to Los Angeles. That's the difference here, right? It's like it's as extreme as you can get. Then it was a walk across desert and land, and he's hopping on a ship to sail to Tarshish. So he goes to Joppa. It's a port city, modern-day Tel Aviv is where he goes to. He gets on a ship heading in the opposite direction. He doesn't want to preach to these guys. Why? They're his enemies. He hates them. I mean, maybe there's some fear involved a little bit, like maybe they'll kill him, but mostly it's because he hates their guts. And so he's going to go the other way. Preach to Nineveh, no thanks. And he had a reason for saying no thanks in the natural. Right? There's an underlying reason why he's being disobedient in his own mind. But here's something we all need to understand about Jonah's response. Where the Spirit of God wants to bring us is always different from where our flesh wants to go. 100% of the time. Keep that in mind wherever you are, wherever I am. Things may seem great. We may feel comfortable. It may feel good, but we need to assess it even then. Human nature is we only assess when things are bad. But are things feeling good because it's feeding our flesh? Because it's making our flesh feel better about being flesh? About our sin nature? We have to analyze that. What is God asking us to do? Now, I'm not talking about times when we're praying, we're seeking the Lord, and the, the Lord drops something into your heart, and it aligns with what the Holy Spirit has already been telling you. That's the way it works. That's the way it should work. But there's times when God asks us to do stuff, and we're like, what? Because our self rebels against that. Right? So Jonah has that reaction. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Not a chance. And he flees. The Bible says he flees from the presence of the Lord. We know literally that's impossible, right? The Bible says wherever, you, wherever I go, you're there. I can go all the way down to hell, you're there. But the nuance here and what the, what the word is trying to say is Jonah removed himself from a situation where he would have to be in the will of God, right? Where he would experience God's full favor and presence because it was not acceptable to him. He took himself up, got on a ship, went on a little cruise. And we see later in the chapter a storm comes up. The sailors are terrified. They're in this little boat. If you've ever been on a little boat in Lake Anna, even a little boat wake will, will shake you all around. You're in a little wooden boat in the middle of the Mediterranean, and the storm is raging, and there's a very real chance that ship is just going to come apart and you're dead. And so they're throwing cargo off to make the ship ride a little higher in the waves so the next time they come over a crest, it doesn't hit quite as hard, that they won't maybe break up. They are understandably concerned that they're going to die. But where's Jonah? He's down in the hole sleeping. He's just chilling. The captain comes down, finds him there snoozing while everybody else is losing it over the storm. 
and he's just sleeping. And there's another lesson for us here also. We can't let how we feel in a situation be our guide as to whether we're in the will of God or not. Jonah felt fine about his situation. He was asleep. He was catching some rest. But he was outside of the will of God. He was sleeping away even though he was in active rebellion against God. Are you with me? Are you understanding me? How do you feel about where you're at in your life? I feel good. That's not the measure. So no worries at all for Jonah. The captain yells at him somewhat understandably. Hey, how about getting up and praying to your God? Maybe he'll help us out. Like we're all doing what we can. If you can't do anything else, throw some cargo. Get up and pray. Wake up. The sailors cast lots. It's kind of like rolling dice to see whose fault is this. Like, this has got to be somebody's fault, which is a little odd because storms happen, right? But they're trying to pin it on somebody. So they roll dice, and it lands, oddly enough, on Jonah because it is his fault in this circumstance. And they say, which is, I mean, it's kind of weird. Like, yeah, you're the reason for the storm, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? What you do? Really? So he says, you know, hey, I serve Jehovah. You know, he's the guy who made the sea and the land, and they were afraid. Why are they afraid? Well, it tells us that he had already told them he was running from the presence of God, which is a little bit of a contrast, right? Yes, I serve Jehovah, the guy I'm running from. I serve him. Right now I'm serving him by running away from him. So he told them, hey, I'm running away from the presence of God. So they know they're in big trouble. This guy's in rebellion against his God. And unfortunately for us, his God has just shown up in a way that is not too healthy for us right now. And this is real. God is in this storm. God is doing this. And they have come to understand it. And so they ask, what do we have to do to get this to stop? Because, hey, we don't serve your God. We don't know the rules. We don't know the regulations. What do we have to do to get this to stop? So Jonah said to them in verse 12, So Jonah said to them, pick me up and toss me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know that it is on my account this great storm has come upon you. Jonah says, hey, toss me over the side, then you should be good. Because this is my fault. And so they toss him over the side. And the storm immediately stopped. But they didn't want to. What's interesting is these pagan men didn't want to. They first tried to row away from the storm, but they couldn't. And they get ready to throw him over, and they're like, God, don't hold us against us, but he asks us to. Right? And the storm immediately stops. They see the power of God revealed before their eyes. The instant he hits the water, it says immediately stopped. It didn't wind down. Storms don't immediately stop. They wind down. They get lesser. Right? Especially on the ocean, because it's forever. You can see, oh, there's a storm. It stops immediately. And it says it impacted them to the point that they made vows and sacrifices, and committed themselves to God because the visible power of God impacted them. Now, I can't say if this changed them forever. The Bible doesn't say. But the indication is they changed their allegiance, at least in the moment, to the God who could calm the sea. Jonah is having evangelistic impact unintentionally. Right? And the message for that is God will work. God's going to work, even if you're getting tossed in the water. Now, back to Jonah, though. He said, you got to throw me over the side because it's my fault. Was that his only option? No. He, he could have said, I have come to realize I've made a horrible mistake, and I'm going to repent. And when we hit Tarshish, I'm going to get another ship. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to Nineveh. I'm going to be obedient. And I am convinced, knowing the nature of God, that the storm would have also stopped then. But why didn't he do that? Why? Because he would rather drown than preach to Nineveh. He would rather die than preach to Nineveh. He would rather have his life come to nothing than submit to the will of God in this. Now, we, we are not in a boat. We are not in a physical storm right now. But we all come to a point many times in our life when we choose to either submit to the will of God in a situation or try to find our own way out of it. And if we choose to try to find our own way out of it, we'll end up like Jonah, in a worse position than when we started. So Jonah is floating around in the sea, soon to drown and die, because that's what happens when you're in the sea and there's nobody there to rescue you. Eventually you get tired and you're gone. 
But instead of that, verse 17 says, God appointed, not an accident, God appointed a great fish, not a whale, to swallow Jonah. Fish, go swallow him. And the fish swallowed him. And he was in that fish for three days and three nights, which is a picture of Jesus. One of the, the prophets that Jesus mentions by name is Jonah. He said, just like Jonah was in that fish belly for three days and three nights, I'm going to be in the earth. It's a picture of Jesus' death and resurrection. Unfortunately for Jonah, he was alive and in a fish. But God sent the fish to keep Jonah from drowning. Sometimes God's provision doesn't look like provision, right? And Jonah is actually thankful for that. If almost all of chapter 2 is a prayer from Jonah, the only prayer in the Bible, of which I am aware, that occurred while someone was inside of a fish. It says he prays this prayer from the belly of the fish. Probably a little muffled. God heard him. And it takes getting swallowed by the fish for Jonah to say, you know, prayer might possibly be an option I need to pursue at this point. None of the other stuff. So he's inside the fish. I'm going to read the prayer real quick and just listen to what he says. He says, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast away from your sight, yet I will look again to your holy temple. The waters encompassed me, even to my soul. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the foundations of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. And you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who follow vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, this is a beautiful prayer. And his sincere thanksgiving for not drowning. And it's very hopeful because this dude is talking about salvation while the fish still has him in his stomach. But what is missing from this prayer? Repentance is missing from this prayer. He is still not in a position where he is repenting. It's a beautiful, sincere prayer, but he is still not committing to obedience to God. Now, in verse 9, he talks about sacrificing to the Lord with his voice and paying what is owed. But the word tells us in multiple places to obey is better than sacrifice. Jonah is not at that point yet, but his prayer does obtain a response from the Lord. Jonah 2.10 says, after he prays, then the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. Now, that's a mental image, isn't it? He's standing on this beach, it may be Joppa where he started or somewhere else on the Israel coast, and he's covered in fish vomit, seaweed all around his head, skin bleached white from the acid in the fish's stomach, just exhausted, three days and nights and a fish, I mean, that can't be fun, right? Standing there, basically back where he started, but much the worse for wear. And God picks it right up where he left off, and Jonah, here's your mission. God renews his call for Jonah's obedience to the mission. In the beginning of chapter 3, he says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. Yes, Jonah, you've been through a lot. You may have been through a lot spiritually. Yes, Jonah, you look and smell terrible, You may look and smell terrible spiritually. But God is calling Jonah to go to Nineveh and to tell them what he said. And God God is telling us today to walk in obedience no matter how we look or smell or feel in our spirit. When God tells us to do something, there's no door number two. Right? There's no second option There's no secondary assignment. So Jonah gets up, and he goes to Nineveh. Now, depending on where he is, that's anywhere from like a 10-day to a 15-day walk. He may have gotten a caravan and gone there faster. Uh, I don't know. But um, he goes. Now, he's not happy about it. 
but he goes. He's like that kid in Sunday school who the teacher says, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Finally sits down. He says, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. Jonah's going to Nineveh on the outside, but on the inside, he's still headed for Tarshish. Right? He's physically obedient, but his spirit is not there. And I can imagine when he arrived at Nineveh, hot, because it's the desert, tired, sunburnt because his skin was bleached white, right? So he's sunburnt now, maybe still stinking of fish puke. I don't know. Maybe he got a bath in between. I doubt it. And angry. He's angry. Why do I know he's angry? Because he started angry. And the sea and the fish and the walk didn't help him get less angry. He's mad. He didn't walk into Nineveh. You're the god of the city. Like, he didn't do that. That's not where he was at. The Bible says Nineveh was a huge city, and it would have been a three-day journey across Nineveh for him to complete his mission. Massive city. It says in chapter 3, 4, Jonah began to enter the city going a day's walk, and he cried out, in 40 days' time, Nineveh will be overthrown. I don't think he was too enthusiastic about his message. We'll find out exactly why later, but basically he didn't care if they repented. He didn't want them to repent. So he did his message. But here's the, the thing. The Ninevites responded immediately. It said they repent, they proclaim a fast. The king orders everybody to put on sackcloth, which is like burlap. It's this really coarse, itchy fabric, not fun at all to wear. Nobody's eating. They're putting on sackcloth. The king puts on ashes. All is a sign of repentance. And it says they repent from their evil. They turn from their evil and violence, and they cry out mightily to God. Even the animals are crying out because when you don't feed an animal, it lets you know about it. So even the animals are crying out, and they're clothed in sackcloth, a sign of repentance, the whole city. And here's the other thing. They repent with no guarantee that God is going to spare them. It says we're going to repent of what we now see as evil and violence in the hope that God may relent. We have a promise in the word if we repent that we will have eternal life. They were repenting just in the off chance that God might change his mind. Now, we know that Jonah's desire to preach to Nineveh was non-existent. However, the, the, the repentance of Nineveh was real, and it was strong. They were all in. They fully repented with no guarantee that that repentance would gain them life. Our repentance needs to be like that. When God illuminates our need for a Savior, we must make him Lord over all of our life. When he exposes sin in us that displeases him, we need to surrender it. And if we love that sin, and it's hard to admit that we have sin that we love, isn't it? Isn't it? We have sin that we love. If we have sin that we love, we start asking him to help us hate that sin like he does. To fully repent. And at the end of chapter 3, when God sees their repentance, he relents and he doesn't bring the disaster on them. Now, we can get into a long theological conversation about God's omniscience and would he really have destroyed them when he foreknew that they were going to repent. God is just and merciful. He said their wickedness came up. They were doing something that, that did not align with his holiness. And if they had not repented, they certainly would have been destroyed. Later generations who did not repent they were destroyed, but they did repent, and in his mercy, he forgave them. And this is where we get to the message of Jonah in chapter 4. It's really a culmination of all that has gone before and played out between God and Jonah. Jonah, when he sees their repentance, is livid. Beyond normal anger, just turning red and frothing at the mouth, just livid that these guys who killed people in Israel that he probably knew and loved and committed battlefield atrocities and did all kinds of horrible things are getting away with it in his mind. The Bible says, now this greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own land? And I think he said it like that. 
This is the reason I fled before the Tarshish, because I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in faithfulness, and ready to relent from punishment. Therefore, Lord, take my life from me now, for it is better for me to die than to live. And this is not rhetoric on Jonah's part. He's not being dramatic. He would rather die than to see Nineveh forgiven by God. Suicidal rage is a real thing. We normally associate it with depression and other things, but look it up. Suicidal rage is a real thing, and that's what Jonah's walking through. I would rather not be here than to have to watch that. You can see why I think his preaching may not have been that enthusiastic. He didn't want them to repent. He wants them to die. After Jonah's done ranting for now, God gets right to the heart of the matter in verse 4. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? And instead of responding to God, which, you know, that's an interesting choice, not responding to the Lord, Jonah parks himself under a little lean-to he makes and waits to see what's going to happen with Nineveh. You see, he's still hoping they might do something that will make God follow through with destroying them because that's what he wants. That's how deep his hatred is for them. And God sends a plant to grow up over this little booth and lean-to that Jonah's made to give him some shade. And Jonah's happy about that. I think it's a nice plant. I still want all these people to die. I like the plant. That's where he's at. And then God sends a worm. And isn't it interesting how God uses creation throughout the book of Jonah to accomplish his purpose, the storm, and then the fish, and then the plant, and then the worm. And the plant withers and dies. If you garden, you probably know what that's like, right? You got some tomatoes, the worm's eating it, and you got no tomatoes this year. So the worm comes in, and it, the plant grows up in a day, and it dies in a day. And then God, just to, you know, kind of pour it on a little bit, Jonah sends a scorching east wind. If you've been in a very hot place, you would think, oh, the wind's going to bring some relief. If it's really hot and the wind is blowing, it just brings more heat. It's not cooling you off. And then the sun is beating down on his head, so he's not having fun. And again, Jonah asked God to let him die. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah replied, it is right for me to be angry even to death. It's a plant, dude. It's a plant. From the beginning of this book right up until now, Jonah's only concerns have been what? Jonah. You can see selfishness stamped all over his thoughts and words. Now, some scholars see Jonah as a comedic book or a parody, but I don't. I think it's a sobering and frightening book because I see me right there. Jonah is not unusual. Jonah is not some weird human being. Jonah is us. You see, I think Jonah is exhibiting a place that we can all get to, even as Christians. A place where, we, where what we want can drown out the voice of God in our life and twist us up into a place where we're blind to our own sin. Did you know that's possible? That we can have sin in our heart we're unaware of? It takes God to bring it to light. Jeremiah says, my heart's deceitfully wicked above all. Who can know it? God can reveal it to me. When God puts us through tests and lets us walk through hard times, it isn't so he can see how we'll react. He already knows. It's so we can begin to see our own hearts, the sin there, and choose whether we're going to continue to walk in it or let him change us. And that's what he lays before Jonah. Jonah, here's your heart. If you could see my heart, you'd never ask me to preach again. The self that's in there. If I could see your heart, I'd never want to preach to you again. Right? Right? I'm talking about the part that is not redeemed, the old man that is still there if you're a believer. If you're an unbeliever, I'm talking about everything that's there because you don't have a new man. He's trying to get Jonah, who is a servant of God, to wake up and realize his thinking is warped. He says, Jonah, you're upset over to, to the point of death over a plant you did nothing to help grow, which is only here for a day, over a plant. 
Should I not therefore be concerned about Nineveh, this great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left hand and also many animals? He's saying, Jonah, you're so angry about the plant. You're so willing for me to wipe the city out to the last person. There's 120,000 kids there that are so young they don't know the right from the left yet. And there's all these innocent animals who have no stake in it. They've never attacked you. And you just want me to wipe them out so you'll feel better about it. Should I destroy all of this just to satisfy you, Jonah? Now, let's be clear. Nineveh was a terrible city. There's no description bad enough to describe how bad these people were and wicked. I mean, God's not joking when he said their wickedness came up before me. He took notice of how bad they were. That's why he was pronouncing judgment on them. But they repented. They repented. They repented. We don't talk about repentance enough these days, right? Repentance is turning away from your sin wholly and going in the other direction. God is revealing again himself to Jonah here and reinforcing the message, my ways are not your ways. I am a God of love. You see, Jonah, you think maybe I just love Israel. No, no, no. I love Nineveh just as much as I love Israel. And, and Jonah, what's more, I love Nineveh just as much as I love you. He kept going after Jonah when he was in active disobedience. Too many times as Christians, you know, we see a fellow believer who will fall, right? Or they're, they're having some sin going on in their life, and we just write them off. What happened to John Smith? I don't know. He had this thing, and he did this thing, and whatever. I don't know. He's somewhere, right? And that judgmental spirit will rise up. And I'm not excusing sin, but that's not God's nature. When we fall, he goes after Jonah, and Jonah's not, whoops, I sinned. Jonah's in active, willful rebellion and disobedience against God. I have no interest in doing what you want me to do, God. Have a nice day. And God says, well, I'm coming along. We're going to get you to where you need to be. Because God's not just doing something in Nineveh. He's doing something in Jonah. Because Nineveh is nothing without the people in it. God doesn't save places. He saves people. People like to say, well, the, you know, God's economy is different. And a lot of times they just mean God deals with money different. God's economy is different because his currency is the souls of people who he can redeem for eternity. If we love anything more than we love people, we are not aligned with the heart of God. God loves Nineveh, and he goes after Jonah. And God loves us so much, he doesn't play games. God doesn't play games. He has a purpose. He wants to draw us to himself. We don't know him. We don't have a relationship. He wants to establish a relationship through repentance and accepting Christ as our Savior and turning our life over to him. If we know him, he wants to draw us further, further in. And I'm sorry if you say it. This is not associated with you at all. You can keep saying it. I won't judge you. I'll tell you some of my foibles. But I hate when we say, God's taking me to another level. Because in the, in the Western American mindset, what we mean is God has taken me here. God will take us to another level, but this is what he means. I'm taking you to another level, Jeff. I'm taking you to another level, Jeff, because I have to decrease while he increases, right? And pride, you know, pride, there are people who will say, well, I don't, I don't struggle with pride. <laughs> you struggle with lying. Because we all struggle with pride. It's just a matter of how it manifests, right? And the, the, the enemy will speak to us in one of two ways, which is all just a manifestation of pride. Well, you know, I'm pretty special. Uh, I'm nothing. And both of those are manifestations of pride. Because you're not nothing, right? And that's just drawing a focus on you. Jeff, do you really think you're nothing? Come on, buddy. You're not nothing. Right? And that's just sucking people into it. Good, right? So I can make it about me. Because in my unredeemed mindset, the universe should revolve around me. But God, through the cross, shatters all that and says, this is what the universe revolves around. This is what victory looks like. This is what success looks like in the kingdom of God. Man, it's just, that's not logical. How do I got to go preach to the end of other butchers? 
Because that's victory in the kingdom of God. And with the, the last statement that God says to Jonah, which is the weirdest statement any book ever ends on, you know, I have a bunch of kids here and, and you know, a lot of animals too. Some of your, your virgins may see cattle, but it just means like I have, I have things that are alive that if I set this city on fire are going to experience torment. And you're worried about a plant. Get some perspective here. You see, the message here is that God is loving and compassionate. And I believe that this last sentence he speaks to Jonah finally gets through, finally does what the sea didn't do, what the fish didn't do, what being puked up on the beach didn't do, what the two-week walk to Nineveh didn't do, what the plant dying in the sun didn't do. The Holy Spirit opens his eyes and he sees this. I believe he sees this and he repents. Jeff, it doesn't say that in Jonah. How do you know that? Well, because there's a book of Jonah. If he didn't repent, he's not writing it down. <laughs> right? I'm going to go be an administrator in Jerusalem, and we're going to forget it ever happened. But I believe that the, the Holy Spirit finally got through to his heart and said, this is important, Jonah. These are people I love. This is real. And Jonah, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, wrote down this story so he could influence not only Nineveh. You see, all those people who repented died. And another generation rose up that didn't repent, and they acted out on the previous evil and violence. But Jonah's story is not just for Nineveh. It's for us. That's why it's in the Bible. And the message there that God's ways are not our ways, that he has love and compassion for us, and that he is not going to be satisfied with leaving us to our selfish ways, that's the message of Jonah. You don't get to go to Tarshish when you call yourself a child of God, when I've told you to go to Nineveh. We see the face of Christ and how God reveals himself in the book of Jonah in 1 John 4.10 where it says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's the message. As the worship team comes, I'm going to wrap it up, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about what this means for you. I'm not sure where you're at today spiritually. But I do know wherever it is, this message applies to you. It applies to me. Today, we might be in any of one of the situations Jonah found himself in spiritually. Maybe you're flabbergasted at the audacity of what God has asked you to do or walk through. Like, seriously, God, how are you even asking me to do that? Maybe you're actively running away from obedience. You're in rebellion and you know it. Maybe you're letting the consequences of that disobedience wash over you rather than repenting. Maybe you're thankful that God has actually rescued you from some of those consequences of your disobedience, but you're still not obeying or repenting. Or maybe you're obeying God with your actions while your heart is still in rebellion against the Lord. I'm, I'm going where you want me to go, Lord, but I'm, I'm not feeling it. Or maybe one of another thousand ways where you're not in alignment with the will of God in your life. And this is not a message of condemnation because here's the thing. God is merciful. God is love. And Jesus died on a cross so we can have a relationship and so that God can continue to draw us to himself. In a week, this church is going to go out into the community and to ignite Fredericksburg. And here's the thing about a fire. You can ignite a fire but if you don't keep feeding it the spirit, the wind, the air, it'll go out. And after you ignite Fredericksburg a week from now, if we don't keep going out with the wind of the Holy Spirit in us as we touch people, as we come across, that ignite is going to go out. We have to be the body of Christ every day. We are all ministers of the gospel every day. I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to ask you to respond. Wherever we're at, God is asking us to surrender it to him because he is beautiful. He's beautiful. His mercy is renewed every morning.